Can you start with your name and your occupation, please? Hello, folks. I'm Shikha Pandey. I'm an international cricketer representing India. I'm an and I'm an Air Force officer as well. Squ uh, squad leader. Squad. Squad. Squadron leader. Yes. Squadron leader. Sorry, I got that wrong. I was so close. I'm going to ask you something that uh, I know you want to talk about. Your father has a saying when it comes to cricketers. What's yes. the saying? So my father says, uh, "You are not a complete cricketer unless you've donned the whites." And this is with respect to you. You have not become. I um, mean, you you have not fulfilled your potential as a cricketer if you've not played Test match cricket. Now that is a perfectly normal human reaction, I think, for especially for an older gentleman uh, to have as a cricket fan. The problem with that is that women cricketers are not allowed to play Test matches so much so that one of my all-time favourite cricketers, Susie Bates, who's an evil genius captain has never played a test match. And I don't think your father is saying that she's not a real cricketer. I think what he's trying to say is that he sees test cricket as the ultimate form of the game, which is how you were brought up, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I still remember as a kid growing up, uh, writing my board exams, I would still wake up at 4.30 in the morning to watch Ashes, watch India play in Australia. I think uh, test match cricket for me as a kid growing up was my ultimate favorite. Obviously, there was no T20 cricket. I'm a 90s kid then. Uh, but then, yes, I, I absolutely loved uh, watching Test Match Cricket. And there were days that I would watch Test Match Cricket in the morning and go at 10.30, 10.30, uh, you know, AM, IST to, uh, to write my pre-board exams. So I've had a lot of fun watching uh, some immense battles uh, play out in front of me on the television. You have played over 100 times for India and you have played two Test Matches. Are you happy or sad with that? Uh because you just mentioned about Susie Bates, comparing myself with her, I'm very happy. <laughs> because the year that I debuted for India in 2014, we were fortunate that I got to represent India in the third format. I played test matches as well. Uh, but then I'm not happy that I've just played two test matches. I would want to play many more test matches for India because I think as a cricketer, like you said, it's it's the absolute pinnacle of cricket. And I'm sure it is it is the format that most of us growing up want to play when we grow up. So, yes. It's, it's actually incredible looking at your, your career because you started playing international cricket in 2014. And you happen to start at the exact time that India play two test matches in a year. It could not be any more perfect. And at that stage, I'm assuming you're thinking, this is great. We could play one or two test matches a year from here on in. And you've played no more test matches since then. Yes, I mean, uh, it's also because the other boats were not very interested in playing test matches because I remember when I started playing cricket, I mean, there's a backstory to this. I started playing cricket very late when I was 18. So I started in the year 2008-9 and those two years, because women's cricket had merged with BCCI, we happened to play multi-day formats for those two years. So 2008-9 and 9-10 series uh, uh, seasons were the ones that I played for my state side. But after that, that format was scrapped because... I mean, women were not playing test match cricket any longer. But then once we got to know that we are going to be playing many more test matches from 2014 till about 2018, we had the format again introduced. So in the zonals, we used to play multi-day formats and it was so much fun. The time, By the time we actually started getting a hang of it, how do we go about it, the declarations and all of that stuff, again, the Again, the format was crap. So, yeah, very disappointing on, in that regard. But, I mean, seriously, love loved playing a uh, multi-day format. Yeah, I mean, well, I think New Zealand, the BCCI, I think, asked New Zealand at one stage if they wanted to play a test, and New Zealand said no, which is why Susie Bates has never played. Uh, which, I, as a, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's a crime against cricket if she ends up with no tests. Although, as you know, uh, I'm very big in the stats, and it's incredible. <clears throat> When you, when you look through it, there's only been seven women who've played over 20 tests. Charlotte Edwards had a 23-year career and she played nine, no, sorry, a 19-year career and played 23 tests. Elise Perry, I don't know if you've heard of Elise Perry, um, which she's quite a handy cricketer. Uh, eight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's played eight tests. So it's a, it's a, it's an absolute ridiculous sort of situation that we, we find our, ourselves in. Also, I, I just want to, pick you up on something that you said there. You keep saying multi-day cricket. You're calling it multi-day cricket because women's uh, cricket doesn't have a first-class system, does it? Exactly. I mean, so when I started playing cricket, like I said, in 2008-9, they were two days. 
then when we started playing zonals the last two years of the zonals were three days so i mean there have been instances where people have been you know trying to figure out how to go about declaring the innings and all of that and i call it multi day because uh, i mean i understand the fact that you cannot be playing four day games uh, in the domestic circuit that's very difficult for you to organize but when you want to go ahead and play test matches i mean you need to prepare for them uh if you are not going to be be playing multi day formats in your domestic circuit probably you you will not have targeted you know preparation for the test matches that you are going to play and you will not have the quality of uh, results that you want to have so that's why i keep saying multi day format when when you were coming through uh and you you know you you were starting to play cricket you would have been seeing young boys of a similar age you know um coming through did you find that they were developing quicker because they were playing more cricket and especially more multi-day cricket? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. In between tournaments when I would go practice with under 16 and under 19 boys, I would there was a stark difference in the way they would think about the sport and then I realized that their understanding of the game is so much better. I wouldn't say the knowledge, but the understanding. uh for example, I just give you an example. I was bowling alongside these two under 16 boys. and then i i overheard a conversation where they saying let's set the batter up and i'm like wow i as a in, i mean i had not played international cricket by then i was 21 probably i had played 3 years of domestic cricket probably uh, two seasons of uh, multi day format test i mean multi day format matches but i still had only heard of you know setting the batter up but there these two under 16 boys are actually talking about setting a batter up and i was amazed i mean it was something that was actually happening in front of me and these guys probably must have played uh, the format for quite a long time because they had such good understanding so i then realized it's not just about the game but it's about the gameplay as well it's about the awareness the game awareness and how do you go about doing things in uh, i mean during you know playing those three days so i realized they grow up quicker because in terms of understanding the skill um, you know having the skill set to perform at that level and any any women cricketer who had played alongside me would not still have that understanding if they have not followed test match cricket so it was amazing i mean just an example that i'm giving you but i was i was amazed by the kind of understanding they had of the game and i was envious that you know why i wasn't thinking that way and now that i'm slightly more mature i understand all of it and as a kid growing up uh megra setting up sachin getting him caught behind i mean that is the highlight of you know watching test match cricket so i then realized it's so 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 good to play multi format uh you know uh days game do do you think that women's cricket is a little bit one dimensional then because with so many women around the world only playing one day cricket or t20 cricket i i i would think so i mean uh because there are no test matches happening i mean uh, the boards also have taken a back seat so only when we start having like i said i mean i i actually use the wrong word uh if we can have more multi format series happening bilaterally for example what's happening between australia and england uh, that way you actually have targeted preparation and i'm not just talking about one off test i'm talking about probably playing three countries in a year and playing three test matches and i mean the the basic uh, argument that people come up with you know when talking about women's cricket is the quality is in there but if you're not going to let us play more frequently the quality is never going to be there so make us play three test matches in a year two test matches in a year and then we'll have targeted preparation for those games and you will see the results i mean you see the quality coming through so yes i do think uh, most of the women cricketers are uh, are you know white ball cricketers and not red ball cricketers How do you think it held back your game specifically then? Because you're obviously you're a bowling all rounder, uh, you know, a, a seam bowler. For those who haven't seen you play, how do you think it held you back? Um, you know, um, directly. Uh, for someone who's played a lot of domestic cricket, I mean, I have realized that in India, especially, I would say. uh the wickets are not very helpful for bowlers so as someone who's played so much i realized that when i'm going to be bowling unless it's a new ball and i'm getting it to swing later on it's just about keeping it tight so there's this vicious cycle of bowling dot balls which lead lead ahead to taking wickets it's you know we we only talk about bowling lot more dot balls and creating pressure and you know then buying a wicket so for me in white ball cricket if you actually go to see that is the enforcer but when it comes to red ball cricket and i'm hoping that is i mean that's my point of view 
in red ball cricket, according to me, uh, the balance between ball and bat is so, so good. Uh, for me, if you ask me, the bowler has a huge say. The bowler is someone who is the enforcer for me in a red ball cricket in multi-day format. So, uh, I mean, what else? I mean, you are basically learning how to take wickets and not just creating pressure by bowling dot balls. I mean, that's the biggest takeaway for me. And I'm a huge advocate between having balance between ball and bat. And for me, if we play more test matches, we are essentially learning the skill of taking wickets. Uh, I mean, taking wickets and being able to take wickets or learning the art of taking wickets is entirely different for me. And as a test match cricketer, probably I'll have that art. And also this, this I mean, Every format, you get to learn so much. In T20 format, you will not really succeed if you do not have the slower ball uh, variation in your repertoire. So as a test match cricketer, probably I'll get back work on reverse swing. And it's a new it's a new art that I'm going to be learning. So I'll enjoy it that much more. So it's, it's an opportunity for me as a cricketer to learn so much more. I suppose, just to take it away from test cricket for a minute, do you think that women play enough cricket, you know, at, at the international level anyway? I think we, I mean, I, I can talk from the Indian point of view. We, we did play a lot of cricket uh, going into the 2017 World Cup, going into the 2018 uh, T20 World Cup and the 2020 World Cup uh, till COVID actually stuck. We were playing a lot of cricket. I mean, we, I mean, we had a busy calendar till then. But I don't think women cricketers around the world are playing as much. I mean, there are so many more uh, countries, associate countries or probably countries which have been given full status now. I don't think they are playing enough cricket. I mean, there's, like I said, again, I mean, you want quality to come. You have to have the women cricketers play more only then the quality is going to come. Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a question that I haven't prepared you for that's, that's going to completely throw you, hopefully, and make you very upset later. What is more important at the moment, that women are playing test crickets, uh, <laughs> women are playing test cricket, or just getting more women to play professional cricket around the world? Uh, see, if you ask me, both these aspects that you've spoken about, they are, they are interrelated, if you ask me. So if you want quality in, in cricket, in women's cricket, test match cricket, according to me, is a way you can bring in quality. So a very simple, a simple way of, doing, of, of going about this is actually by expanding the pool of uh, women cricketers or the nations who are playing cricket. Uh, instead of having just 10 teams competing, have 16, team comp uh, 16 teams competing. So if I am the president of a women, um, you know, uh, associate country, which is just qualified uh, to play in the T20 World Cup, I see an incentive. If I am from, I am a president of say a country like Thailand, women's cricket, I know that when I look at the women's uh, scenario, I have a better chance of catching up with, you know, the standard of cricket or the quality of cricket. So it's just an incentive for me. First, let them come in and, you know, get into the T20 World Cup. So it will be an incentive. And again, I mean, I'm just uh, going way ahead and talking about this. Have multi-format, uh, you know, series, bilateral series, like I mentioned before. So maybe the quality will not be there. So start with six countries playing, or the top six doing it. Uh, so I play against all the other top six countries. And then when the other countries who have just gotten into the T20 World Cup increase the pool from 10 to probably 20, probably 16, uh, I can see a smile on your face. And then when associate countries start, you know, catching up, then get the test matches in. So if you ask me, I cannot really choose between the two because I think they are they are related, completely related to each other. Let's talk about the first argument against women's test matches is generally that they are too expensive to run. Uh, you know, there are a lot of boards around the world that have trouble even doing men's tests, to be fair to them. Um, my argument for that would be that that is exactly the same argument that they used against women's cricket being uh, run in, in the first place, that it was too expensive and that it would make any more money. Now it is actually making money. We're found e finding a new hurdle for it. Um, the other one is that the quality is not good enough. And I think everything that you've sort of said there is sort of linked uh, uh, to that. Essentially, you played a test match in 2014 when you had very little practice in multi-day format beforehand. The idea that you are suddenly going to be brilliant at test cricket when you haven't played it, it you know, one or two players, and we, we see Washington Sundar did it recently for India, didn't we? It does happen, but you, you're not going to imagine a whole team is going to be completely brilliant at it. And he still would have played a lot of multi-day cricket growing up. 
essentially, for those people who say that the quality of test match cricket isn't good enough, so we shouldn't play test cricket, that's kind of like a chicken and egg situation. Because if we don't play any multi-day cricket or test match cricket, no one will get better at it anyway, will they? Exactly. I mean, uh, I I read this from a coach of one of the leading, uh, you know, uh, women teams. And he said that we are playing just one of test in two years, probably. So we are not going to have targeted preparation, like I said. You know, so if I know I'm going to be playing two or three test matches in a year, I'll have targeted preparation instead of just molding my one day a game into uh, just to better suit the uh, better suit the test match format. It's not going to help. So if I, as the coach of the team, know that I'm going to be playing three test matches and if the multi format uh, system comes into play, there are points to be taken. So if I'm not going to be playing one format well, then obviously I'm not going to get those many points. I'll not have direct qualification. I'll go play qualifiers. I mean, unless you want to play more games, yes. But then uh, targeted preparation is only going to happen when you play more test matches. And like I said, the more we play, quality will come in. I mean, uh, I remember in 2014, we played one off test against England and then we came back home and played against South Africa. But I'm very sure if we had to play many more test matches against, against England in England, it would be a close series. And I mean, I'll never forget the test match, the way we played. And for the first time in my whole uh, playing career, we played with four uh, fast bowlers, four medium paces in the team, which has never really happened. So it was amazing from, from every side of it. So when I look back and think that we actually got to play two test matches, I think I was very lucky. But now that there is a test match, I mean, it's been announced that we're going to be playing a test match. It's, it's amazing just to be thinking about what it's going to feel like. You you did a Twitter thread, um, what a storm, was it a storm, a uh, rant, uh, not that long ago about uh, about a topic weirdly that just got um, it, it's about a topic that just weirdly uh, became a big deal in basketball again. Um, and I'm a huge women's basketball fan. I think I've told you this before that uh, where I grew up, the the local teams there was like a. The women's team happened to be, you know, a 20 minute walk from my house and the men's team happened to be in the city. So it was easier for me to get to women's basketball and straight away I, I and I developed watching both of them. So I knew that women's basketball was this kind of sport and men's basketball was this kind of sport. For a lot of cricket fans, women's cricket has been completely invisible up until very, very recently. And then suddenly it's on the TV and they can't help but compare it to the men's game. And the minute they do, they just, ah, Women need to bowl faster. First, first before it was bowl faster, it was hit the ball harder. Then they started doing that, and then they changed it to bowl faster as well. Uh, your Twitter thread, uh, if you could, if you could surmise it, uh, you know, as such, was basically you people don't know what you're talking about, uh, and you should get out of my way. Can you take us through some of your finer points? Firstly, uh, to tell you the truth, Jared, I was very happy that people were talking about it. <laughs> when people are talking about it, actually they're paying attention, I mean, to whatever I had to say. So I was very happy at the very outset that so many people were talking, even if there were negative thoughts or whatever, everyone is uh, is free to give their opinion. So, I mean, I found it very, very funny when people came up with so many suggestions about decreasing the uh, length of the pitch and decreasing the size of the ball. I, I just gave out very good. I mean, I thought they were logical explanations. So people said that to decrease the length of the pitch. I mean, my, my immediate question was, you want to bring about some change? Why do you want to bring about the change? So if you, you're, you are telling me that Shikha Pandey needs to be bowling at 135 kilometers per hour as a medium pacer, um, I'm being very honest. I would love, I would love to love for that figure 135 kilometers per hour flashing in front of my name when I'm bowling. But is it going to do any justice? I mean, you just need the ball to be coming um, better on the bat? Is that the reason? Or do you want me to hurry up the batter? So you need to understand the the intent first. Okay. If you want to the bowler to be, you know, uh, hurrying up the batter or you want the bowlers to have a upper hand, uh, there are so many other ways of doing it. The balance between ball and bat, according to me, in white ball cricket doesn't exist. In women's cricket, if we know the rules after the first six overs, we just have four fielders allowed. And I can tell you, it's very difficult when in Arisa Hiri is hitting you. And, and, and you actually have so, you have to have so many plans on that given day to, you know, bowl to someone who is, who is hitting the ball that well. So that's, that's one thing. And if you want 
I mean, there is no question of uh, the balance between bat and ball. If you want the bat, the, the ball to be coming really nicely onto the uh, onto the bat. And secondly, with respect to a bowler, if I'm going to be bowling to a Sophie Divine who's hitting the ball so hard back at me with just what 18 yards, I mean, I have to just, just duck or probably not bowl the ball to save my life, and it's not going to be doing any justice to the bowler. So those were the final points I wanted to speak about, and then there was. Side of the ball, inside the ball. My only problem with that was a tennis ball is slightly smaller. This ball is lighter. Will will it travel? You want more runs to be scored, but will the tennis ball travel that that long? And I heard this argument by Ian Smith where he said you can decrease the size of the ball, but the weight needs to be the same. And I thought it was such a logical answer. So decreasing again. But another funny thing is, I have practiced for ten years of my life to be able to bowl within that twenty-two yards and getting the good length ADR and you know, literally marking those uh, those ADRs when I'm practicing. And suddenly one fine day you coming and telling me, okay, just bowl from eighteen yards. So my good length has literally become an over pitch ball. So I have to go back and do everything that I've learned in the previous ten years of my cricketing life, and come back and you know start bowling as a different shikha pande, which is very difficult. So those were a few things, and then I always have believed that if you can give uh, the, I mean, if you can give Sneko and all of those technical equipment uh, into women's cricket, that's how you would want women's cricket to grow instead of you know making changes, bringing the boundary lines in. I remember we toured South Africa in 2019, 2018, January 2018, and the first thing that the bowlers would uh, you know look for was after coming down from the pavilion, from the dressing room down onto the ground for warm up, is how short is the boundary line? There were literally days when it used to be 50. Meters, and we were like, "Wow!" I mean, what am I going bowling today? From Yorkers from ball one. So yes, I mean, uh, so that was probably a rant. I would say initially it started with that, but I just wanted my thoughts to be out there for everyone to understand that if eighty-six thousand people could come watch us play mm. at Melbourne Cricket Ground, so we are doing something right. And if you want to compare us, compare us with what we were in two thousands, uh, rather than comparing us with men's cricket. Well, I mean, I, I started covering. I think I started visiting international women's cricket around two thousand and nine, um, and I covered it first time professionally for Cricket Info in twenty twelve. The difference between what cricket was like then and women's cricket is like now. They're not the, the men's sport has got marginally better, and you know, uh, you know, the far, you know, someone like Pat Cummins is more accurate than Dale Steyn, and Dale Steyn was more accurate than Alan Donald, and. We're having little changes like that within the men's game. Rashid Khan bowls leg spin, but faster. All right, all those sorts of things are happening in the men's game. The women's game. When I first saw it, throwing the ball in front of a boundary was was not、uh, an easy thing for most of the women to do. It was quite clear that they were amateur、um, and that they weren't spending all their time preparing for the game. Their boundaries were brought in, and people still weren't clearing them. And I've been to a women's big bash game when Harman Preet has come down the wicket and hit a spinner over cover for six. There's also is it um. Danny White hit a ball over point for six, I think, against、um, Australia or New Zealand not that long ago.、Uh, there, there were when I first started covering women's game, a six was like a huge event in a in women's cricket. It has completely changed, and also I think one of the other things you might have talked about in that Twitter rant is it's little things too. If we start making women's pitches shorter, we actually need to make dedicated women's、uh, grounds around the world.、W、women are struggling to get onto the、uh, the available grounds. How are they? Are we going to all these governments around the world going to make extra grounds for them? You couldn't play、um, you couldn't play a game、uh, back to back either. So you couldn't have the double headers, which is, you know, maybe eventually women's cricket will outgrow. But in the short term, that's still quite an important thing for women's cricket. It just seems like it's such a bad idea on so many different levels. And it, it, oh, because I'm a basketball fan, I always go back to the thing of,、um, oh, we need the women to slam dunk. No, we don't need the women to slam dunk. Women's basketball is a really interesting sport on its own, be partly because they don't play above the rim, so they have to be smarter, you know, but beneath their knees. It can be, it can exist and be different, but it seems that we're not quite yet there yet. But I think you're right. The fact is that you know, ten years ago, people weren't even talking this much about women's cricket. So at least we're at that point, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, I was, I was firstly very surprised, and secondly, I was, I was 
pleasantly surprised that you know people were talking about it and like you said if someone i mean we find someone who who watched women cricket in 2009 and is has not followed women's cricket at all and is watching women's cricket in 2020 he will actually come up and say he or she will come up and say that it's gradual i mean it's exponential mm-hmm. uh, the growth in women's cricket which is not the case with men's cricket and i guess as a youngster growing up it's a shame that i did not really have women cricketers at my, as my idols because women women's cricket was not there on telly but i'm very sure right now a 5 year old kid a 6 year old kid irrespective of their gender would still be wanting to play like a mithali raj would be wanting to blow bowl like a chulan goswami i mean so it's so important for media houses to cover women's cricket and for people like you to ro- talk about women's cricket and it it helps a lot i mean believe me it helps a lot when uh, when we have so much coverage of women's cricket Uh yeah I mean it, you don't have to pay me to talk about Mathali Raj I'll talk about it all day um best technique in cricket. Uh I want to bri- briefly go on to the ICC for a second. So the ICC has just given all men's teams with test status allowed their women's teams to have test status. I got a lot of thoughts on this which you may or may not be able to join me in. Uh the first one is that that's a absolutely nonsensical reason to give a women's team status. Uh it I don't agree in this the whole status system doesn't make sense to me anyway. Just because your team was good in 1928 um doesn't mean you should stay test status forever. Sport is supposed to be about performance. You should go up and down. But let's move that to a side for a minute. Now you're saying because your men are good at something, your wi- so the Brazilian women and the Thai women who are rapidly improving in their markets can't aren't any uh, you know can't get test status because their men's team aren't as good. The, and then the third one is that Afghanistan now have a team that is qualified for women's cricket but they don't actually have a women's cricket team so they are a, they have an they have a non-existent women's test team it it feels like and I had a look at this I think this is right that in the first 10 years of the ICC taking over women's cricket which I think happened in about 2004 and 2005 before then the women ran themselves they there was only 10 tests played feels like the ICC have like just suddenly realized that women could play test too and they've done this I don't know what you would call it. It's a it's a it's not even a band-aid, is it? It's like it's like giving a free drink to someone who has just paid for a drink. Uh yeah, I mean, uh, as players you do not really have much say in what the administration is going to be doing, but I mean, it's about voicing I mean your opinion and I I'm very sure if you ask any any women cricketer right now who's not even paid for their country are playing domestic cricket, they would love to have multi-day format. and they would love to play uh, you know test match cricket because uh, you learn so much from test match cricket i mean test match cricket and multi day format is actually known to churn out quality players and you are playing cricket probably to you know to become better every day and that that's your ultimate goal in life you know to become better at what you're doing so uh, can not really say so much about what icc is doing but i'm very sure i mean uh, with us playing more test match cricket uh, uh, and probably uh, giving good results uh, they will you know get down to getting the multi format uh, you know bilateral series into play i mean yes what you said is it's 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 very unfortunate <laughs> uh, very diplomatic of you don't worry no one from the icc would ever listen to this podcast uh, a shout out to my friends from the icc there um the um here's the, here's the other question here's the other tricky one for you to answer Right now, would it be better if there was a women's IPL and there were let's say six teams, uh overseas a few a few overseas players and uh national players or right now would you prefer there were test play a, a test being played more regularly? Let's say let's say every every one of the top six women's team played two tests a year because I would think I think about this from a development point of view. I I I'm with you that you I think w- women's test cricket would grow the game and the players would be better. But I also think if you had a women's IPL, you would have more professionals playing and that would, you know, it it, it would the, the women the, the great thing about the women's big bash for me is not that it's on television and all that sort of stuff. It's that there are now 40 or 50, you know, professional women that weren't there before, which means the whole level of the cricket has been raised in Australia. The I- women's IPL could do the same thing in India, couldn't it? Yes, I mean women's big bash no but no one realizes but we need to give credit to women's big bash because it is bridging the gap between so many countries. I mean South Africa for example had eight uh women cricketers who went and played big bash this this year. So uh, 
if we can have an IPL, I mean, that's the best uh, thing to happen. I mean, I think we have the domestic pool of players. I mean, recently there was a uh, there was a whole huge uh, cry uh, that you know we do not have the depth, we do not have this, we do not have that in domestic uh, circuit. I played the domestic circuit this year, and I can easily tell you there is the depth there. So if you have, for, uh, like you said, six teams, I would. I would love to be part of an IPL. It's T20 challenge right now, but I would want to have an IPL with six teams there. Just for the very simple reason that, you know, as cricketers, you want to learn the game. And if you have four uh, four cricketers, international cricketers playing alongside you, you learn so much. Just sharing the dressing room with them. I mean, getting to know how they go about their skills and, you know, learning how do they prepare. You, you learn so much. And also... Uh, from a bigger picture point of view, uh, a small kid, a five-year-old girl watching so many women cricketers watching, uh, playing cricket will get, will get inspired. And as a kid, I did not really have a women idol, but women cricketer as an idol, but a five-year-old kid would see that, you know, there's so many women cricketers playing, so many matches being played on the telly. And probably parents will also support the kid. I mean, if she wants to grow up uh, play professionally as a cricketer. The parents would support her dream, which would not, which was not the case when I was growing up. I mean, I still had it good. There were so many other women cricketers. When Metalidi and Juludi talk about their journeys, it is, it is amazing that they still continued playing cricket because it was their passion for the sport that you know kept kept them going. So, uh, from the bigger point, uh, I mean, looking at the bigger picture, it will be amazing to have a women's IPL, uh, bridging the gap between women's cricket all over. And, and it's important to note, because every time I say this, people go, oh, there's already a women's IPL. No, there's an exhibition tournament at the moment. What we are talking about, you and I are talking about, is f- at least four to six squads of 15 to 20 women, uh, professionally paid, and we're talking about, you know, minimum 10 games probably, but hopefully, you know, around 14, uh, you know, 12 to uh, 15 games. Uh, we're looking at a proper league, aren't we, which is what the Women's Big Bash was. That I think that is, for me... Uh, I'm I'm with you, and you know it's your the, the the anyone watching this on YouTube will see that your smiley face question when I said what do you want to talk about you said why women should play test matches with smiley face with the heart things in the eyes I don't know how to explain that better for anyone listening to this on the podcast but um, you know I think. I understand that but for me I just think we need to get as many women playing as possible um, and that's why I want to do that but. Yes, I think we're in a situation where we should be able to do both. I think you know my theory. My theory is that we get, let's say, six women teams from around the world. Uh, I'd say seven. I'm okay with seven. And we sell it as a as a global system. We go to you know Sky and Star and Sony, and we say to them, for the next five years, you're going to have this many tests and this many women ODIs and this many T20s. We're going to sell it as a general pool. We're going to make sure all the women are paid, all the umpires are paid, all the you know the ground fees and everything are paid. Then I think there is no doubt that you could get enough money to justify playing all this. Everyone would have a guaranteed amount. And then you have your Women's Big Bash 100 and IPL in between those. I think over the next five years, that would be the perfect way to grow the game. But I want to talk about you just for a little bit here because, you know, we've gone on and on about your pet subject. But I want to talk about your career a little bit. You played two tests and in one of them, you hit the winning runs. That's as as a as a young girl growing up when india didn't even play many women's tests and it wasn't on tv how incredible a moment is it for you to hit the winning runs for india in a test match so recently i was talking to my domestic side and i was asking all the girls which is that one moment which has uh, made you realize that you know playing so much cricket is worth it so for me hitting those winning runs playing the test match will, will be a career highlight for sure i mean i have actually free the shirt of mine I had a souvenir the stumps. I actually took it, took everyone's autograph and I've actually, re- actually put it up on a wall here. So, I mean, I, I cannot really describe and I had, I like reading. So I would always read about batters or bowlers being night watchmen and their anxiety. And I can tell you, I was so anxious. I'm a sound sleeper, but I didn't really sleep that night. And the next day, I mean, because we were in England, we wouldn't really get our Indian kind of food. So we would have hash browns and all of that. So all the hash browns from all the tables in the Indian um, hotel was, you know, silently put forward towards my table and said, eat well, you're going to be batting today and you're going to be winning. So all the batters had came up to me and gave me all all the advice probably for my whole career. And they said, <laughs> you just need to stay there and play well. And throwdowns from the batter. Smithy was like 
please take the throwdowns back well so i was like yes i will so i mean i have always enjoyed uh, playing uh, test match cricket and uh, the multi day format as well i was a bankable batter i mean i still bat number 4 in my state side so i i have i pride in my batting capabilities and it was amazing just to be there hitting the winning runs and i read that in 2006 we won against england in taunton and uh, mitali di juludi and karudi were the only three from from the side who had played before so uh, the day the morning of the test match when i got to know that i'm playing the test match first i was so happy and then we had this march mass uh, cap distribution ceremony going on so there were eight of us who had never played test match before and the three of them you know distributing the caps so amazing feeling i'll never forget i mean i actually wrote about it as well uh, the four days that we played cricket was amazing the the ground that we played at wormsley was a perfect you know backdrop and everything so we'll never forget we'll always cherish those moments do you know what i've made runs at wormsley so i think that actually discounts your your runs there a little bit it's a nice pitch to bat on ball comes on very well uh you personally i think this is fair to say correct me if i'm wrong I think emotionally you see yourself as a red ball cricketer not a white ball cricketer despite the fact you've played a million white ball games. Yeah, I mean if you ask me in my order of preference it goes test match one day and then T20. I am an old school in that regard and I would always uh, love to play more test matches and there's there's no two ways about it. I've always uh, loved watching test match cricket. I actually watched T20 cricket as a student of the game. thinking about what the what are the fields that the bowlers are setting and all of that what slower balls are they bowling it's more about being a student but when i watch test match cricket is just for pure enjoyment of the game one reason i say this is i know you're desperate to play more tests and you're hoping to be picked uh when india play england um coming up soon but you currently average 37 with the bats and 21 with the ball in test match cricket and i'm going to be honest with you I think the absolute best thing you could do is retire because those numbers are so good that you're never going to be able to keep them up. Uh and it would just it's going to ruin it. I don't want to look down on you further in the, in your career because your numbers are no longer you're like on this pedestal for me at the, at the moment. You're like you I call it the Aubrey Faulkner pedestal and all you could do is fight. next time you go out you get you know a, a net backer from Shrubsall or something. You're out LBW. So I think you should retire from test cricket and focus on the white ball stuff. You you do not know I am working so hard to be a uh, hussy and I'm <laughs> I'm going to be not out in all the innings that I play and I, I'm working on my bowling I mean I'm a bowling all rounder so uh, I mean jokes apart anything to play more test matches I don't really care about my records and uh, just to be able to don the whites and get out there have the red cherry in the hand I mean it's amazing I want to ask you one final question. This is kind of uh, hypothetical. You you started your international career in 2014 as we said, and it happened to be the year that India played two test matches. Uh you're a you're you're a seam bowler, so there's always a chance of back injuries and and general muscle things. Uh you're you're in your th- 30s now, so you're a dinosaur basically by seam bowling. I mean it's incredible that you can uh, still walk. Um With that in mind, if you had started in 2015 for India and by this age, you know, you got a couple of injuries and you could no longer bowl at the same pace and in how much do you think you would look back on your career if you had not played a test match and it would it would have bothered you if you'd missed out on playing a single test match for India? Uh firstly, when I started out playing cricket as a 5-year-old kid, I never really thought I would play cricket. I mean, uh, because probably my father is a teacher and I was more more into academics. Uh, so only after I actually got to know that women play cricket and there is such good competition, I started enjoying the sport and that's why I started training to be a cricketer when I was 18. Uh initially I never thought uh, there was there was a dream as a kid uh, doing all those interviews and mock interviews and imitating all the possible bowling actions i've done all of that but then when i realized that i could play cricket and uh, i never thought i would get to play test match cricket because test match cricket wasn't happening so for me firstly to be able to represent india was the was a dream come true but uh, i would say that uh, playing test match cricket was a bonus for me at that time and but when i look back if i had not played test match cricket i would be really sad and like i said my for my father i would wouldn't be a complete cricketer because i'd not played this matches but then yes uh, like i said in in the beginning that i i consider myself very lucky and fortunate and blessed to have played those two test matches because 
Uh, to be very honest, we didn't know after 2015 when the other boards were not really very happy, uh, you know, having us play test matches against their sides. We were not very sure when we would play another test match again. And uh, to be able to, you know, play another one, hopefully, uh, that will be amazing. So I would be sad that when I would finish my my career that I had not played test matches. But like I said, very pleased and uh, blessed. One last question. Sorry, just to put this on the end. You talked about those interviews. Uh, there wasn't women's cricket on TV. So when you would do mock interviews back when you were a child, were you pretending that you were playing men's cricket or women's cricket in those interviews? I was playing men's cricket. I, I'll be very honest. I was. Uh, I used to go left arm spin. I used to, which was my absolute favorite. I used to imitate every every uh, male cricketer possible. I have bowled like Azhar Mahmood. I have imitated Lance Close. Now, he was my absolute favorite in 99. Uh, I have tried imitating Sean Pollock's action. My sister was a huge fan of Pat Simcox and I was a Sean Pollock fan. So I've done that. I have I have imitated every, every possible cricketer. And uh, like I said, I never really thought that women's cricket existed. So it was all about thinking, playing alongside all those male cricketers. Isn't it awesome, though, that now there are young girls imitating you? I hope. I mean, uh, when I finish playing cricket, I would be, I would consider myself to have done a little service to women's cricket in India if I would be able to inspire at least one girl to take up this sport. Because when I look back, uh, the work that the women cricketers, the ex-women cricketers have done for us without, you know, getting any attention, uh, like the way we are getting right now, it's amazing. And probably this will be a little dedication to the work that they had put in. And they never really got appreciation for the work that they put in. So this will just be a little service to the nation. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thanks a lot, Jared. Thanks for having me. Huge fan of your videos and all the writing that you do. Oh, well, we're cutting that bit out. We can't have people being nice to me. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Red Inca. There is more information on my guests available in the show notes, including their Twitter profiles, if they have one. This is the important bit, though. Please review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere, really. Share it on all the social medias and just get it out there. If you can, act it out in plays on your balcony with your loved ones. This podcast is made possible by the people who support us at Patreon, so thanks to those who already do. And there is a link to Patreon in the show notes as well. Red Inca is made by me, Jared Kimber. Nick McCorriston makes everything sound better for your ears, and the theme tune is called The Prisoner by the Red Crickets. <laughs> <laughs>